Here is the fourth podcast in our Inside the Summit series. This episode features William Metz from Walmart speaking on the topic of how sourcing professionals can lead from the front and proactively create value. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, as we talked about uh, just a moment ago, I'm between you and the end of the day, I guess. Is this the last session this afternoon? Yeah, I thought there might have been one after this. So uh, you won't see a lot of words on my slides, right? Uh, that was mentioned. You're not going to see a lot of words, slides, charts, or graphs. Make it interactive. Ask questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, and we'll see if we can uh, get some learnings out of this. As the title implies, what we're really talking about here is how can sourcing professionals really lead from the front? So, you know, there are many cases where I think people feel like they get called in to do a deal or they get asked to provide something. Go find a supplier who can do this for me or go make this relationship work. But there are a ton of things that you can do for your companies to lead from the front and actually bring value to them proactively. And that's really what we're going to talk about. So I'm not going to talk about how to manage relationships or how to do a sourcing transaction. It's really about what are some of the proactive things that you can do to create value. Now, what's important here is these are things, again, that are not new, right? I mean, these are things that I've applied again and again and again over my career. And they're simple, easy things, but we just don't do them. And I'll ask you some questions as we go through this process. See if you guys actually do these sorts of things. Because, again, in my experience, they've created value time after time. And I think if you apply some of these, they'll do the same thing for you. So uh, just 10 seconds on me. I uh, spent the bulk of my career at Procter & Gamble more than 20 years. Retired from there about four years ago now. Currently work for Walmart uh, doing sourcing, vendor management, kinds of activities. Uh, worked for GE a long, long time ago before that. So have spent the bulk of my career at big companies. Uh, started doing technical work early in my career, but shifted about 15 years ago to doing strategic partnership, uh, alliance management, all sorts of externally facing things with third parties. So be more than an order taker. What does that mean? What does it mean to be more than an order taker? Right? It's ask questions or actually be proactive, right? An order taker is someone who sits there and waits for their customer to come and ask them to do something for them and then spends time figuring out how to do what the customer asked them to do. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I do that from time to time. I actually have a group of people who you know, do that from time to time. But it shouldn't be the only thing that you do, right? There's got to be a proactive element of what you do if you really want to create value and do something distinctive and different for your customers. Right? So I'll tell you a little story about creating value. And uh, you'll hear me use the term Value, 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 because I think it's so important to talk about value and think about value, right? It's not about just cutting costs. You hear a lot about, well, wage arbitrage, and you can negotiate. It's more than that, right? Value to me is delivering the best kinds of relationships I can deliver fastly, efficiently, and with a set of terms and conditions that allow the two parties to both create value. And so everything that I mentioned in terms of creating value and proactively creating value will be with that in mind. It's not just about price. So a little story. Uh, that's not actually the guy. But uh, in the late 1800s, there was a transformation going on in the retail space. So I'm currently working in the retail sector, so I happen to pick a retail story. Uh, it's not the story of my company, but it's the story of a company called Woolworths. So there was a guy who worked in a store. His name was F.W. Woolworth, right? And he went into the store, and they told him his job was to stand behind the counter with his pad, and as customers came in, write down what they wanted, Go fetch those things off the shelf, give them to them, and take the money, right? So in a way, he was servicing his customer, right? They were getting what they expected, but he wasn't really adding any more value. So he was a fairly creative guy, a guy who thought about, well, how could I make things better? And so 
When there were downtimes in the store, he began to look at the merchandise on the shelf and say, well, gee, these things have been here forever. You know, a customer never asked me to fetch these things. You know, they're kind of dusty on the shelf. We have to clean them up once in a while. What if we took those things that aren't selling well, and what if I stood up a little table out in the store and let the customers actually come and see them and we marked them down? And so began kind of discount merchandising. And what they found was, wow, people started coming into the store to see what was on the little table of all the stuff that wouldn't sell before. But more importantly, while they were there, then they took the opportunity to look for other things, right? And so so was born kind of a whole new value proposition in the retail space just because somebody went above and beyond and looked for an opportunity. He analyzed a little bit of data, and then he decided, how can I use that data to create value for his employer, his customer? And the story goes on, right? He became one of the richest men in the world, built one of the tallest buildings in the world. We'll come back to that later. And uh, very successful, right? Unfortunately, in recent years, he hasn't been, or that company hasn't been as successful. But uh, great story of a company that endured for many, many years based on those principles. So what we're going to talk about today are what are the kinds of things you can do in the sourcing, vendor management space, alliances that you can do, third-party relationships that will enable you as sourcing professionals to kind of open up the same kind of value for your companies. And again, they're simple things, but if you do them, you'll create value. So the first thing is a seat at the table. So how many of you have a seat at the leadership table of your internal or third-party client or customer, right? I mean, do you get invited in? Do you sit there next to the HR person, next to the finance person? Or are you a sourcing person who gets called on just when they want to do a deal, right? So working your way into that venue, that relationship, so that you can hear what is your business partner thinking about doing? What are they struggling with? What are they trying to achieve as a entity, and how can you help them achieve that, right? Unless you're in those meetings, you don't have that opportunity, right? So part of creating value is understanding the struggles that a business partner is trying to overcome, trying to deal with new business initiatives that they're trying to achieve. And so a simple thing like having a seat at the table, right, inviting yourself in and finding your voice at that table, right, not just sitting there and listening, but proactively asking them, providing input, challenging them to say, here's how me and my role and my function can help you achieve what you're trying to achieve. All right? Second thing, create a base case. Now, this seems like the simplest, most fundamental thing, but you know, I ask people again and again and again about this notion of, well, can you tell me how much this particular thing is costing you today? Or how long it takes you to do it today? or what's your level of performance is today? People don't know that, right? Because it's hard work to go in and figure out just what something is costing or how well you're doing a particular task. You know, if it's project management, well, do you measure SPI and CPI and all those nice industry standard things? Or do you just kind of say, well, the projects kind of go okay or they don't go well or whatever, right? And so understanding for your customer, the level of performance that they're getting, whether it's an internal or an external service, opens up the possibility of then saying, I think there's a value creation opportunity there. Or it may flip around the other way, right? You say, gosh, you're pretty darn good at doing this thing. We validated that by gathering this data. And so therefore, there's not an opportunity here, right? You know, the transaction cost of shifting to something different may not be worth the potential small incremental value creation. But you don't know the answers to those questions unless you have this data. And too often people wait till somebody says, well, I want to do a transaction and I want to outsource it. And then they start doing that. Why not do this all the time, right? Why shouldn't you, as people who help your business partners achieve value, Know this all the time, right? Why shouldn't you know how much it costs to do a transaction of a particular type and whether or not insourcing it or outsourcing it or sending it to a far shore or keeping it in-house is going to create value or not? 
But nobody does this until, if ever, right down before the transaction, and they try and throw something together to justify the deal. All right? Benchmark performance and cost. How many people benchmark on a regular basis the products and services that they buy from third parties? Two hands. Three. Three hands out of everybody here. Benchmarking is, it's been around forever, right? But it's the simplest, easiest way to know whether or not what you're getting is at least consistent with maybe what your peers are getting, right? Understanding, well, I'm paying X for this type of role, uh, or I'm paying Y for this kind of, you know, BPO transaction, or it's taking me this long. And when I say benchmarking, it's not, again, just about cost. It's about performance, right? Because both are elements of value. And so you need to understand not only how much is something costing others, but how much value is it creating? The other piece of this that's important is you can go out and get benchmarks, but that's not the only way to do it, right? You can build up your own internal cost, right? You can have an independent third party do it for you, or you can do it for yourself. You know, there are any number of sources of what we call should cost data, right? You take a piece of equipment. There are a number of places where you can go and say, how much should I pay for that piece of equipment? Well, you can tear it down into its pieces, have somebody do it for you, and build up the cost of what does it cost to do that and what is their likely margin and so therefore what should I pay for it? Or if you're letting labor work, you can say, I want you to do this work for me, but I want you to evaluate the work and tell me how much you should think it should cost. And so doing that kind of blind benchmarking, right, so that you're asking one or two other people to essentially give you information about what you should be paying for something, again, identifies opportunities or validates that you're already getting good value, right? If the should cost is X and you're paying near X, maybe there isn't an opportunity. But when somebody comes and asks you, well, are we getting good value and you can't answer that question, that's a problem, right? You should be able to answer that question. In fact, you should answer that question in advance and be going to your business partner and saying, I think there's an opportunity here. You know, the going rate for this kind of work or this kind of transaction or this product or service is X, we're paying Y. I want to launch something. I don't want to wait till you ask me to do it. I want to launch an initiative to uh, take some value uh, and create it in this scenario. Right? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the answer to that question is you need to look at how different is something really, right? And by that, I mean, you can get into this game of a provider always saying, yeah, but, yeah, but our people are better or this work is slightly different. And I think you need to push back on that and really say, is it that different? So take, for example, things like uh, rates for various IT skills. There are well-established role descriptions you know, that you can go to in the industry and get that. And so I think you push back on that to say, no, they're not different. Now, do you from time to time have situations where somebody said, well, this is a hot new skill and there's a lot of market demand for it and may it demand a premium in the marketplace? Maybe, right? But everything is not unique and different such that you have to pay a different rate for it. Joint business plans. So, uh, again, when I use the term joint business plan, it is really, think of it as an agreement between yourself and your business partner on the things that you want to achieve. So, what are the five to ten key measures of success for your business partner that you can influence? Right? Those are the things that should go on your joint business plan in terms of measures. And what are the five to ten initiatives that you can launch that will help achieve those goals for those measures? That goes on your joint business plan. And it becomes a simple tool that you use as you go back to your business partner and say, 
hey, you told me that one of the things that you were looking to do was to uh, speed up this process, right? We have a vendor who's doing work in this space and they're too slow. And we want to take, you know, three days average time to perform one of these transactions to a day and a half average time. So that's our goal. We've launched this initiative. It's got these milestones along the path, and I'm going to update you as we go throughout the year to help you understand that either we're achieving that or not, right? Either it's on track or it isn't. But again, it gives your business customer confidence that you're proactively doing things, right? You, you just didn't ask them, well, speed up the time. You're taking steps on your own to ensure that more value is created on the behalf of your business partner. All right. Question? I have a short question. Uh, developing a, uh, um, a joint business case means that you, as a customer, has to accept that a supplier has different business goals, uh, such as making a profit. How do you deal with that? Because yeah. uh, when a customer is trying to buy as low as possible, it's... Uh, I think it's, it's a conflict. It is in many cases, but the absolute best outcomes come from when incentives are aligned, right? And you can structure many of your relationships with third parties in a way that the incentives are aligned, right? It does not have to be a I win, they lose, or vice versa, right? Take a simple IT example, right? Uh, how many people have contracts where if the number of tickets in an IT support scenario goes up, the supplier gets paid more money, right? No. Why, why not flip that around and say, if the number of tickets goes down, I'll pay more money, right? Because if the number of tickets is going down, the systems are up more uh, or, uh, you know, we're having less tickets altogether, right? People are happier. And so aligning incentives is the best way to do that. All right. So global, uh, question. Uh, so I'd like to go back to uh, uh, the, previous, the, 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 the benchmarking, uh -huh. uh, the benchmarking statement. So usually, um, you know, whether it be through contract changes or additions to, to scope of services, you, you'd often look to add additional services to your current, you know, portfolio with, uh, with the supplier and, and most of the time those cost money, right? So in, in, your, in your expertise, is there a threshold, a dollar amount threshold, um, or even a frequency that you should be benchmarking with um, just because you, we know that it costs money to benchmark and it takes time and effort, so, so what should the ideal frequency of, of benchmarking be or is there... Um, uh, a, a dollar threshold of new services that you should go to benchmarking for? Yeah, I, I think you've touched on the two key points, right? If nothing significantly changes other than dynamics in the marketplace itself, probably every year or two is a good frequency to benchmark. If you are significantly changing the scope of the work that you're doing with the third party, right, from a volume perspective, from a content perspective, from a complexity perspective, you probably need to rethink with every change in that complexity, what's the right price that I should pay? What should it cost? So the more you change and the more the change is significant, the more frequently you benchmark. But all things being held constant and you're only looking to pick up market changes, every couple of years is, I think, enough. All right. So global labor strategy. Global labor strategy is really all about trying to understand how work gets done in an organization, right? So this one speaks a lot to kind of the labor element of partnering with people and understanding how do we as an organization get our work done? Who does it? What levels do it? What roles do it? What locations do they do it from? Where do we partner with people to get work done? and really understanding what are the implications then of moving things around. So tie some of these things back together, like go back to the base case model, right? So with the base case model, you can say, well, in our current model, with P 
people in these locations and having this split between internal and external resources, my costs are X, right? And you can begin then to take things like benchmarking data and other data, and you can begin to slide the different variables and say, well, if we moved and aggregated more work here, what would be the implications? Or if we brought this work back inside, maybe because we're having some challenges, what would be the implications? And so a global labor strategy is really a tool that helps you holistically look at an organization and how they get their work done and what's the optimal mix of people and places, right? You know, do the resources in the locations that we're at have the skills that we need? Uh, are we paying a premium price? Can we get the same skill set someplace else? Do we gain competitive advantage by having people who work for us do this because of the unique knowledge, skills, and understanding that they have versus having a third party do it for us? Right? But very, very few companies actually put together a holistic strategy that looks across all those things. Right? And in fact, in many companies, it's very fragmented even by organization where people say, well, within my organization, I'm going to get my project management help from outside, but I'm going to get you know, uh, my development help from inside. Looking back, stepping back, and looking at it holistically is the way you begin to see where are the opportunities, right? You're having great luck doing this kind of work here with these kinds of resources, but maybe somebody you know, in another part of the organization is doing that work in a totally different way. And so being able to understand where are the resources, what are your retention rates, how much are we paying for things, what skills do they have, are the skills unique to a location, can I get this in the marketplace or do I have to train my own people? It just opens your eyes when you really see that data, right? Because then you can go back to your business partner and say, look at the, the things that I've gleaned out of this data that I have and based on it, here's some recommendations that I have on how we might create more value. Category strategies. So uh, this is an interesting one as well because uh, when you're buying something, and so by strategies or subcategory strategies, I'm referring to kind of a defined group of suppliers who provide something specific enough that you can compare. So let's take an example. Uh, storage, right? So you could say hardware, right? The major IT categories are things like hardware and software and professional. But you've got to get to a granular enough level where the data is comparable. So maybe you drill down on hardware and you say something like storage. Well, who are the major storage providers and which ones are you using and what kinds of results are you getting from them? And have you shared that comparative data with your business partners, right? And have they used it to make some sort of decision? And is it in a consumable format, right? Is it visual, right? Because having all that kind of data on spreadsheets, on computer, it's just so hard to compare. But can you produce something that simple that says, look, we've got three storage providers. Maybe we should only have two. We've got a small amount of business with one, and we don't like them. That's why it's red. You know, they're not performing for us. And then comes the question, okay, could I combine the yellow and the green one, or what's the transaction cost of doing that? And this is obviously a very simple example, and there are probably, you know, 30 or 40 different attributes, both objective and subjective, that you would use to plug into a subcategory sourcing strategy, but just having a model that essentially says, this is how we compare in a subcategory the people who are competing for our business, and this is how they compare to other choices, right? The, the dotted line one would be one you're not using. And is there an opportunity to move to somebody better? What's the transaction cost associated with doing that? But again, being able to reduce that kind of data to a simple visual that you can share with your business partner and say, look, you know, we either do or don't have an opportunity here. And again, it becomes a very great tool to be able to say, I know everybody likes, I don't know, supplier X, the one that's yellow, but look how they're doing compared to the other choices that we have, right? And so it enables you to present data in a way that kind of dissuades people from maybe uh, their favorite vendor or preconceived notions they have about something. 
The really cool thing is when you create something like this, if you have the ability then to say, somebody says, well, what about attribute X, right? This company is more innovative than that company, and I don't think that's reflected in your model. Okay, let's, let's adjust those and see, does it change significantly and materially the position of the supplier in the model, right? Make sense? All right. Leverage scale. This is a simple one, but uh, people just don't do it. Uh, you know, you see all the time companies get fragmented. Uh, you have people in different pockets and places buying similar things. And just getting with your peers in your company and saying, hey, we all buy the same thing. We have relationships with many of the same companies. You know, next time, let's, let's lock our arms, right, and bring that scale to bear against the opportunity, right? Now, to do something like this, you need some very fundamental things, right? Like you need to plan for your sourcing, right? You need to have some sort of forward-looking planning that says, well, what relationships do you have, and when are they running due, and how many things can I match across those to say, you and you and you and I all have something very similar. Uh, we have not locked arms before because we work in different parts of this company. But now that we know who each other are and we know that we buy something similar and we know we would consider using the same vendors, why don't we do that, right? And so the proactive thing is, again, not waiting till your transaction just came due, right? So you've got to go do something. It's in advance of that, knowing and understanding for all the things that you're responsible for managing in terms of a sourcing and vendor management perspective, who else in your company is responsible for something similar? And is there an opportunity to club together what you're doing with what they're doing at some point in the future when you have a reasonable amount of time to plan and do that effectively? All right, open innovation. So open innovation is, is a bit of a passion area for me. Uh, it, it's this notion of so many times, and you heard it actually earlier today or yesterday, right? Don't get value out of my supplier relationships, right? Innovation isn't necessarily the outcome, right? Innovation is the activity that generates the invention that provides some sort of value. But how, you know, you can't just sit and wait for that to come. And you can't wait until you say, I have a need and I want you, a supplier, to deliver against that need for me. Because in many cases, the parties that you're partnering with, they have creative things, innovative things that may be able to be aligned with unarticulated needs that you have, right? Well, if I never knew that was possible, I never would have asked for it to be done. And so the concept of open innovation is a very simple concept. It is find a way between two organizations to essentially have a bi-directional flow of capabilities and needs, right? And some of those will meet in the middle. But in other cases, what you'll see is supplier comes to you with a capability. Somebody in your organization says, I was never even aware that that you know, was possible to do that. But now that I am, my mind is going to all the different ways that I could leverage it. And so just a simple, visible way to bring supplier capability and get it in front of the people in your organization. And this isn't like sales calls and all that, right? Find kind of a systemic way for people in a very succinct fashion to say, Here's something, here's something, here's something that you should be aware of and find a very quick and easy way to vet that, right? Is it something we could possibly use? Does it meet the financial test? Does it meet the technically possible test? Could it be scaled to our scale, right? So a quick funnel that you take ideas through, stage gates that you kick things out of, and then maybe at the end pilot test things with them, right? But it has to be bi-directional, right? And that's one of the things that is so important is to understand and find a way to connect in both directions, right? Again, it goes back to the order taker thing, right? We want to just go to a supplier when we need something and tell them what we need. 
what this is advocating for is a much more open environment where needs and capabilities kind of get thrown out on the table and both sides are trying to see, can I fit my need with your capability? So finally, branding and marketing. Uh, this is probably my biggest passion in terms of uh, uh, what you can do as a sourcing professional to help people understand the value you can create, right? Uh, this profession is one that creates huge value, right? But too often we kind of, we create the value and we move on, right? Helping people understand who you are, what you do, the value you bring to a company leads to new opportunities, right? And that's why it's on here, right? So this session is all about how do you lead from the front and create new value opportunities. One of the best ways to do it is not to be ashamed of telling people about the great things that you did last quarter, right? Because if I come in and I do some work for your organization and you're very happy with it and I get you a great value on the deal and you're having a great relationship, if I let other people know that and somebody else has similar work, they'll come to me as well. So don't be afraid to share your successes. You know, share the information about, you know, obviously, you know, appropriately scoped with the leaders in your organization about what you're doing, the value it's creating, why you're making a difference, because it will lead to more opportunities that may not have been there before. All right. So uh, I mentioned earlier about Woolworths and when they built that building, it was one of the tallest buildings in the world. So we'll come back with a closing story on tall buildings. Can anybody tell me what all three, four of these buildings have in common? And if, if you didn't read the slide notes because of the way she would know. Uh-huh. Exactly. At one point, every one of those buildings was the tallest building in the world. So why am I telling you this? Well, you'll have to wait for a second. We'll get to that. Uh, can anybody tell me something about the three on the right? All similar modern structures. The key thing about the three on the right is all three of them took more than five years to design and build. In some cases, close to 10 years to design and build. And those are all modern buildings, right? Where we have big computers with AutoCAD and all these you know, fancy construction techniques, and they took more than five years to design and build. This one was built in the 1930s. You probably recognize it. It's the Empire State Building. How long did it take to design and build? Two weeks to design and just over 400 days to build. So how is that possible, right? They didn't have computers. They didn't have modern construction techniques. And yet they built that building in just over a year and designed it in two weeks. The way they were able to do that is the people who were responsible for designing and building it said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to find just fundamental proven techniques that can create great buildings and do it fast and reapply them. Right? And so that's why I put it here. None of the stuff that I shared with you should have been new news. Right? They're not, those things that I talked about are not new topics, but people don't do them. Right? But if you apply proven techniques, you can get great results. And that building was the tallest building in the world for more than 40 years. And it even withstood, it was struck one time by an airplane, right? On a Saturday afternoon, and it was open Monday morning, right? So doing things fast doesn't necessarily mean you get a bad result, right? A great result. But they were able to do that because they reapplied learnings. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Don't forget to fill out your uh, evals. <laughs>